never, we never
Seidel. I'm the faculty director of the Arts and Education Program. It's my privilege to welcome you here this afternoon to the first of three in this year's series of master classes at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And where better? Um, this is a series initiated by our dean, Jim Ryan, right here, uh, to both celebrate teaching and to try to understand just what's going on when a master teacher is at work. So while it seems um, it's a very good day for engaging in those two activities because uh, this is the second day of our Teaching and Learning Week. I hope that everyone here uh, knows about the week. It's hard not to at this point. Um, and I hope that you're having an opportunity to take advantage of uh, many of the special events here. Um, but really, at HGSE, isn't every week Teaching and Learning Week? So. Um, I'm delighted that everyone, all of you, are here today. A particular welcome to people who are not part of the HGSC immediate community. Um, uh, before we begin, I just want to mention that uh, you will certainly hear more about this series as the year goes on. But this, I just, uh, it's my privilege to give you the sneak preview. Uh, there'll be two more sessions during this academic year. I believe they're both in the spring, dates, times, all of that is coming. But uh, the first will be Martha Minow, Dean of the Harvard Law School, and the second will be Richard Schwartz, Dean of the Harvard Medical School. So um, it's a great series uh, this year. But now for today, we have an incredible treat in store. Elisa New is the Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature here at Harvard. Uh, her fascination is with classic American literature, reaching back to the Puritans, but also reaching up to the very present day. Her particular interest, and in the one she'll be sharing with us today, is in American poetry. Uh, Lisa is a passionate scholar and a passionate teacher. She's the author of The Regenerate Lyric, Theology and Innovation in American Poetry, The Lines I, Poetic Experience, American Sight, Jacob's Cain, A Jewish Family's Journey from the Four Lands of Lithuania to the Ports of London and Baltimore, and New England Beyond Criticism in Defense of America's First Literature. This is uh, just her major books, uh, much more that she's written. In addition to her regular teaching here at Harvard, Lisa has been a pioneering force in the teaching of poetry online with her Harvard X course, How to Read American Poetry. Uh, she's also completed, is the, is the companion volume published now or in process? In, in development. In development. Um, but look for that, also called How to Read American Poetry. And that's what she's here to do with us today. Give us a lesson in How to Read American Poetry. Um, the title that Lisa gave to today's session is the lecture slash discussion as teaching genre, looking, in parentheses, and loafing with Whitman. As her title suggests, today will be a lesson, or perhaps more precisely, a lecture discussion on one American poet. But, um, but perhaps it will be more about looking than about Whitman, or perhaps it will be more about loafing than about looking. Or maybe it's about all three, and we'll see. So um, I'll say no more, except to uh, just give you the outline for the session today. Uh, we'll uh, start with Lisa leading us in, a, in the lesson. Uh, she'll take about 40 minutes or so in doing that. And then uh, Lisa and I will have a conversation. Um, and then we'll open that conversation up to the whole group and we'll conclude at 5.30. Sound okay to everybody? Great. Okay, one more thing that I just want to make sure that you know <laughs> is that uh, we are videotaping today. And um, <coughs> as we announced on the, uh, on the signs outside, um, that means that it will be up and available for you, I believe, by the time you get home to watch again tonight. <laughs> so, um, or at least to tweet to all of your friends 
that is available, and they should have really been here. Um, with that, I welcome Elisa New to, to teach us. Thank you. Um, respecting the genre of this series, we begin with a lesson. We begin Whitman, the Song of Myself, Day One. May I have section one of Song of Myself. Some of you may have read section one of Song of Myself before. Uh, it, oh, thank you. It may, most of you can hear me anyway, right? Uh, it may be, how's that? Yeah, on? good. Okay. Uh, it may be that section one was all you needed to say no more Whitman for me. Right? I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume and everything belonging to me as good belongs to you. Many, many readers say no thank you. I have plenty of people in my face. I don't need my, a poet too. Right? And there is something overbearing about that self that announces itself to us and alerts us that it, its entire poem, and if you flipped through or scrolled on, it's 52 sections long, right? It's not a small commitment you be <laughs> making to this person you already, from the first line, find a little much. Now, I, as you will discover, find it immensely interesting that a poem about the self imposes and um, uh, ex not only exerts and not only imposes, but projects itself out into our uh, out out into social space, as if to raise the problem. The problem I like to think of as the problem of other people uh, to us all. And we, what's interesting, just to pause on this for a second. What's interesting is that we, as soon as that self comes breathing its hot, affectionate, dog-like breath at us, we rear up into ourselves, right? And our boundaries and our amour propre and our sense of ourselves as bounded, um, as if by reflex, uh, snaps on. That's kind of interesting, and I don't think it's accidental. In a, in a moment, I'm going to start talking about how I think Whitman has an expansive self, and not only an expansionist self. What I've been talking about is an expansionist self that will take you in, right? I encompass multitudes. You know that women, that women. I will start talking about that uh, self uh, soon, but the expansive, the porous, the elastic, the incomplete, the yearning self. But before I do, I probably have to come clean about um, some of the other ways in which were you worried about Whitman, the narcissist, you would have good reason. Um, so some of you know that Whitman self-published uh, his first book, Leaves of Grass. He printed every page himself. Um, so it's a homemade, uh, it's a homemade book. Um, you may not know that as soon as the book came out, he started sending copies to all the literary luminaries of the day, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who sent him back a letter saying, I had to, it's a very nice letter, saying, I, I rubbed my eyes a little bit, to, uh, I rubbed my eyes a little to see this sunbeam were no illusion. I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Some of you have heard those lines. Well, what should an author do with that kind of flattering letter? Probably he shouldn't bind it into <laughs> the uh, next print run. In fact, it's on the first page. Probably he shouldn't begin immediately uh, to negotiate with his with his bookmaking, not bookmaking, like betting friends. What do we call those? Bookbinding. Bookbinding. 
shouldn't have started negotiating with his bookbinding friends about how we can get gold tooled. We can just get, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, R.W.E. on the spine of the book. Right? <laughs> Probably he shouldn't be writing reviews of himself, um, which he does. <laughs> Lots of, and there were reviews, we were hail to the poet that Ralph Waldo Emerson had been uh, asking for in his landmark, uh, in, in his essay, The Poet. A modest poet might not omit his name and put a sexy picture on the front page, and it is. A really pretty, I'm sorry, I should have got copied the sexy picture for you. Um, this, this picture, you're all going to want to see it now, <laughs> says, I am not your mother's poet. Right? It says, I'm not a poet in a study. I'm not a poet with a cravat. I'm not drawing my inspiration only from books. I'm at my ease. Right? I have my hand on my hip. I'm at my ease. I'm in a working, I'm in working man's garb. I look straight out to you, my reader, my lover. Do you think I'm exaggerating? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall know the meaning of all poems. <laughs> this poet says. Right? So that so that what is what is it to read a book? It's an ecstatic act of communion, akin in some way to a sex act. So these are not, mo these are not the moves of a modest man. As uh, Whitman's career developed, he delighted his career that was coincident with the um, development of the history of photography. Photography was really getting off the ground and it got more and more cheap. Whitman had so many pictures taken of himself. <laughs> yeah. There's a very famous one of him holding a butterfly. It's a fake butterfly. You know, it's just so so he's he this is a this is a poet in love with the image, in love with the reproducibility of the self, and I kind of like that. I the, the Whitman the character. Oh, I left out I left out a, an aspect of his of his self-fashioning, of his highly artful self-fashioning. And that is that he was not born Walt. His mother called him Walter. And you know, there's a there's a big jump from being, I'm sorry if any any of you are named Walter. <laughs> but Walter Walt has a kind of virile oomph that Walter does not. I, I really am sorry. Okay. <laughs> name, Walter. You might consider Walt. <laughs> but that, right, so, that there's, so that there is something highly studied about, and, and uh, as though a poet needed to be a somebody, right? Needed to be a fully dimensional figure, and, uh, uh, and needed not to be a flat scholar on a frontispiece. Uh, and so Whitman is giving us uh, giving us that, giving us a kind of celebrity. Having said all of that, um, to be fair, uh, the self that we get in section one of Song of Myself has stayed with us and has stayed with American poets uh, for reasons that are different from Whitman's celebrity uh, charisma. Uh, it's a lot of charisma, but uh, they are different. And I want to begin to suggest some of the ways in which the Whitmanian self operates and then turn with you to read uh, in discussion some lines. The Whitman, and I've put, I didn't want to stand behind the podium. That would be too Emersonian or Longfellow-ish. Uh, <laughs> And, but I can't really see if things are down there, and so I, Whitman would not mind my, uh, my backpack. Uh, <laughs> what is a self? What is a self, anyway? Um, is a self, you all have marched in with yourselves, you know, and they are your body underneath your hairline and down below, as Whitman would say, your boot soles, right? Your self comprises your body and maybe your thoughts. 
uh, and the body part was probably, the body part was pretty controversial uh, in Whitman's moments, so he had to go to a lot of trouble to bring the, the, the bodily back in. That, that aside, the self that Whitman offers us is much more diverse than just the conscious self or the ego. Think of, think of yourself. Many of you are not even really here. It's a beautiful day. You're half here. Right? And that's what we're always half here. Yourself. Women at the very end of Song of Myself, he says, I diffuse myself in lacy jags, which is very beautiful. Right? I diffuse myself. He's like he's saying, like, I am like the literal of the ocean, right? And that line, I am that, I am that rim of foam or that Emersonian circle diffusing itself. That we are, in fact, diffuse, right? That some of you is still out there, right? So that some, so where, what, what is yourself? Yourself includes those worries that weigh on you and bear you down, and the flavor in your mouth from a delicious, piece of Turkish delight you um, snatched out of, you know, some confectionery on the way here that changed everything, right? You're, you left the scent of you on the bus, right? You left the scent of you on the bus, and when we're all gone, the School of Education will not remember most of us but Jim Ryan's self will still be here, <laughs> right? Some of that, that is, ourselves, ourselves are not just those components uh, we, uh, we contain with our thoughts uh, and are sheathed within our egos. Your mother, to the, at this moment, is thinking of you, <laughs> and yourself, is there, and she may be thinking of the you of today, and she may be thinking of the you with sweet potatoes on your face of many years ago. That you, and there are parts of yourself you've never seen. You'll never ever see the back of your head except in a mirror, and everybody else does, right? So that we are not only the selves of whom, of, of which, of whom we are conscious, of which. We are, we are not only uh, our conscious selves, our integral bodily selves, but to add another, we are that set of attitudes that seize and possess us in unfamiliar situations. We are, we are unconscious thoughts. Of which we over which we have no control. We are our intentions and what we do not intend, right? And so the self that Whitman uh, invites us to see is not a focal point or a center, so much as a set of intersections. He will write. Uh, very often, and we're about to look at a section where, uh, where the poet arranges subject, verb, object sentences, one on top of another. He uses what's called a paratactic, ugly word, isn't it? Paratactic syntax rather than a hypotactic syntax, which really means nothing more than uh, not using subordination. The relationship of one sentence or one clause to another is not determined in advance. That didn't did that work? Some of you, you know, how sentences with subordination. One, this is a teaching thing. When everyone looks blank and um, <laughs> completely flummoxed, you know it hasn't worked. You know how it, it, it's, if if I say when I go to the store, I always get Turkish delight. <laughs> right? There's a particular kind of, I don't know what the Turkish delight thing is in my head, but uh, there's, a, there's a relationship, a necessary relationship between those two parts that is not there if I say, I go to the store, I get Turkish delight. 
Women will use paratactic sentences, um, subject, verb, object, and he will often invite us to think about the world as it's experienced by subjects who act on, uh, who perform verbs on objects, right? And, and we, we tend to think of ourselves that way. I'm a subject, I perform verbs on objects. We don't like much being objects, having things performed on us. Whitman's going to blow those syntaxes open so that very often you will have to, in a Whitman poem, you will discover yourself as you are seen by others, or the poet will discover himself as he is seen by others. So the self will often be flung out in some other, uh, in a, in a, out of its subjective, <coughs> it's getting a little abstract, I'll move on. Uh, uh, the self will often be thrown out, out of its self-concern, out of its narcissism, out of its goals, out of its ego. Because self is bigger. Self is much bigger. Self will include your attitudes, your socioeconomic and political, the language in which you were raised. And we all know <coughs> who know other languages that there are kinds of bearing on the world or humor about the world or, right, got that? Or um, attitudes toward things that are and are not funny, that are conditioned by things like the language we speak, or the density of houses, or whether or not we live in, uh, in near, um, in, in neighborly relations with people who are different from us. And so uh, this uh, somewhat lengthy aria to <laughs> Whitmanian selfhood uh, is simply to, uh, is, is by way of inviting you, even as you begin to study a particularly 19th century showman -y kind of poet, a, a uh, P.T. Barnum kind of poet. And Whitman loved P.T. Barnum. He was like, oh, let's go to the circus. Let's go. Let's, if we can't go to the circus, let's ride the ferry. It's as good as the circus. Now let's walk the streets of Broadway. Maybe there'll be a riot or a parade or a political rally, but he loved, uh, he loved the circus. And so even as one in studying Whitman, you start to release yourself to, the, um, to a world where celebrity, where the poet has a different kind of, can deliver a different kind of personal presence than we, than our poets deliver. I was just standing there reading, looking a little sad. Right? The poet in society. We don't have the same. So I'm keeping up the, I, I love being a poet. It's a meaningful activity. But it isn't three ring circus, usually. Um, so even as, even as I've invited you to think your way into uh, Whitman, the 19th century poet, I've also begun to open up um, a whole, um, a, a kind of explosive new way of seeing selfhood and of seeing American selfhood that this poet invites us to explore. Just want to spend a few minutes with you, a few minutes with you, discussing, beginning to um, discuss some lines by Whitman, lines that are uh, in section 15, um, <coughs> section 15, and you, you have section 15 in front of you. You now know, if you didn't know before, that these lines are paratactic, <coughs> right? They are, um, it's, they, there is no subordination that necessitates a connection, a relation between one line and the next. Uh, and so we read these lines. We read what we read these lines, maybe in impatience and frustration, wondering what kind of fraudulent <coughs> lack of care and um, laziness of formal application does this poet think he's getting away with? And plenty of Whitman's reviewers said this isn't. 
pros. This is just a list. This is just like a newspaper. This looks like the one ads. This looks like a page in the newspaper. And Whitman thought, oh, well, that's good. Um, shouldn't poetry? Whitman was a printer. Uh, grew up learning. <coughs> uh, he, when I said he printed, he made Song of Myself himself, he put all of the individual letters in the cases and ran the press himself. Poets in the middle of the 19th century um, often emerged from the world of, or writers in general. Think about Benjamin Franklin, who was raised as a printer, became a journalist, and from thence into the world of, uh, of, uh, of letters. Um, th that a poem could have the everydayness, the topical crunch <laughs> and relevance of the newspaper, uh, that it would also have, so think about these. Um, Emerson said, this book of yours, it's sort of a mix of the Bhagavad Gita and the New York Herald Tribune. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, and I, yes, but one might want to add, uh, and the opera. Stop this day and night with me, and you shall know the meaning of all poems. That's the ambition of a poet who wants to be seized, right? Who wants, who wants the reader to be seized, who thinks the relationship of the reader and the poet is like an, they're clasped um, together. Readers of this poem read catalogs like this, and they're like, we're not buying it. We are not. We don't see any rhyme. We don't get the rhythm. We are, um, it feels, where's the musical ear? And the content is so vulgar. This isn't the most vulgar part. This is really vulgar parts. Um, Whitman invites us, and many of you may have read uh, Whitman in this, in this way, those of you who have. Whitman invites us to think about not only the relationship between ourselves and all things, how who yourself is, just to add, you know, you are your genetic code that came, you are, you are that material that predated you, and that material that will live, um, will live beyond you. Uh, uh, not only that, he invites us to think about the relatedness of all things as they, uh, through adjacency, through content, tact, change each other. So here's section 15. This is one of the most famous long sections of what's called Whitman's catalog rhetoric. Um, form, if one wanted to defend Walter Whitman, one would say, well, no, the lines don't rhyme. But there is a kind of patterning. We're getting grammatical patterning the subject, verb, object, patterning. We're getting uh, what's called anaphora at the beginning of the line, where we're beginning again and again with the same words. And that gives these lines a sort of chant-like quality, right? a sort of musical quality. Sometimes um, one might note that the Bible is written paratactically. And Abraham went to Haran, and then he went here, and then he went there, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then that. So there certainly is precedent. Um, over the years, readers have begun to look at lines like these from section 15 and begun to see how electric and crackling uh, the, that space in between the lines uh, begins to look. So let's just look together at first two lines. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. What are these lines? I mean, well, he's just throwing this, he's throwing that. It's just cinema verite. It's just random. Let's assume that we might say that. 
Or uh, let's experiment with figuring out why one line might have followed another. Who wants to give it a shot? Want to give it a shot? Pure contralto red in a red shirt? No way. Huh? No. no way. <laughs> <laughs> Pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. What are those lines doing together? Yep. Um, it seems like a preparation of sorts. Uh, it takes us to the scene where <coughs> artists are practicing their craft. Yes, I think that's lovely. Yes, it takes us to a scene where artists are practicing their craft. But it's, there's probably more to say, right? There's an irony, there's a beautiful kind of analogy that you've seized on, and there's some irony there as well. Who's, who wants to do the irony? Want to do the irony? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if it's irony, but I was thinking uh, the organ loft is built thing. Uh -huh. And you get the carpenter preparing to build, uh, starting to build. That's a lovely idea. I wouldn't call that ironic either, but I'm glad I picked on you. <laughs> uh, yes, right. That, you know, the, that organ loft to which this poem pays attention is an architectural space uh, in which the voice of this contralto resonates. I, I see a skepticism. That's so. What would you say? Would you like you? This is what you get for shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone must be up. No eyebrow movements. <laughs> no, like, complete impassive. Frozen face necessary in my classes. I'm seeing a couple of things. I'm seeing body with the organs and with and four planes and tongues. I'm also trying to make sense of the S's. Could you put more words around body? I'm seeing body. I agree. Body parts. Uh huh. You know, both of them. Both of the lines have some kind of sound, singing, if you will, and whistling. There are body parts in them that one might interpret, or they're literal. Well, the tongue of the foreplane, we have a picture of a foreplane, I think. Everybody know what a foreplane looks like? Anybody know what a foreplane looks like? <laughs> um, carpenter, anyone know carpenters? Carpenters love their foreplanes. Foreplanes are, and they have lots of them. What foreplanes do is they allow you to smooth uh, to smooth, you know, when you just pass a guy on the street or a woman on the street who's dressing a plank, sometimes you'll hear them smoothing the wood. They're using a foreplane, which has a little sharp tongue. I don't know if this picture's the best. Um, oh, yeah, those are four. See these? these? This is a, that's a foreplane. You'll draw it across. So the body part you're thinking of is the tongue. The tongue, but, but the thing and the human are making the same sounds. Yeah, the thing and the human, or the and and what the happens body. to our sense of the human throat when it's put in juxtaposition with the foreplane? I know this is one of those tortured leading questions one never <laughs> supposed to ask. <laughs> Try it anyway. Do you have one? See? Yeah. See? You, you moved your hand. Oh, sure. Certainly. There's also someone in the back. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He's going to do that to you, though. <laughs> I guess there's a kind of progression from something very fancy, the opera singer, to something supposedly much less fancy, the carpenter, to something not even human, but they're all being juxtaposed and sort of put on the same plane in some way. Yeah, and that's what I would have called the irony, even though your thought was more subtle. Right, that there's a an irony, or there's there's either irony or there's a, a dignity that the carpenter is being accorded, um, where his instrument, right, his tool that had that performs a mechanical function, is actually being drawn into some sort of analogy with the tool of her throat, right, that um, becomes a chamber, and so, and so the mechanical rather than the merely artistic aspects of her art are pointed up. And contraltos, I just read about them. One thing I do when I'm teaching 
is I do always try to learn some new things. Um, even I've taught this stuff before. Uh, but I thought, God, I'm really not sure. I don't really know my contralto as well as I should. They apparently have thicker self. Do you know this? This is true? Yeah, the vocal cords are like thicker and stockier, more muscular. Mm -hmm. So just like you would lift, if you want to be a bodybuilder, you would lift big, thick weights and build big, thick muscles. Uh, that's what a contralto has. Whereas if you're a soprano, you would, you know, it's like doing Pilates. Clea <laughs> 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 saved, so I knew I, I, knew I could. Uh, she could be my lifeline there. Uh, but that, you know that that so Whitman is drawing us into into a world of mechanics, of tools, of the body as a tool is um, offering a, an analogy that has democratizing power, right? It has democratizing power. Yes. Is there is there something more than democ? I mean, the the contralto sings from from the loft. Is there something implied that that we're we're hailing the loft and yet the carpenter the con? You you started by talking about Whitman's uh, desire to be a common man or to appear as a you know uh, yes exactly. Is there is that the irony that that um, yeah. isn't even democratizing but in fact. Uh, somehow implies that the carpenter is making the real music. I, th I think there's something like that going on. That the carpenter, he's really making the real music because as you pointed out, he's making the loft, right? And the loft, uh, just as the self only exists in that whole set of relations that produce it, your self depends in some way on those people who have seen the back of your head, on your mother's knowledge of what you look like with sweet potatoes on your face, right? All that 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 we live in a uh, in a sprawling syntax of <coughs> relations, and me, oops, and many 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 lines of Whitman's song of myself will, in the way that these two lines did, sort of detonate, right? We live or crackle, crackle anyway. Uh, and uh, the, the relationships between us, right? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall know the meaning of all poems. Um, it, that is all, that me, the poet, the poet is modeling the larger me of the universe as well. That is, stop in contemplation, in intimacy, in patient, uh, and uh, watchful hearkening, uh, and the these relations that that the, that what is it then between us, right? All of those relations will uh, will begin to open. So I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs>
actually really mud wrestle with the question mm -hmm. in its deeper sense. And um, the, and I think that that's. And I'm seeing. Really, I'm wondering. Are you all wondering if we if you guess guess the question? I am. Let's see if I no, guess the not. question. Go ahead. I'm going to put the question right out. Okay. Uh, but I do think this is a group of people who mud wrestle with the question. Um, and the question is, what do you teach? <laughs> That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. I teach thinking and learning to think. Um, and so I just keep going. Keep going. I, I think the, that the hardest thing for a teacher is getting people <laughs> Getting the wheels moving, right? Getting, not modeling what um, thinking, not knowing, but thinking, what thinking looks like. And helping people get practice in that activity when one has them in the classroom. Um, you can't be sure they're going to be doing it elsewhere. It should be <laughs> happening there. Uh, and it's not that easy to have people thinking in the classroom. Because they come in from wherever they are, and they're there. <laughs> and so one reason, I may be jumping ahead here, one reason I lecture, I, probably for a little less time than I just lectured to you, but I'm always failing to keep it shorter. One reason I lecture is that I don't really think people can think without having their corks, they, they need to be uncorked a little bit, right? Or, um, you know, it's, it's like, it's actually, the, the wine metaphors all work. You know, their minds need to breathe a little bit. And so I've often watched um, new teachers and they'll have prepared really amazing ideas and they walk right into the classroom and they say, you know, in Melville's uh, Benito Sereno, we can see that, so blah, 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 so what do you think, blah? And no one's thinking yet. Yeah. <laughs> They're not, and so, so I am always trying to arrange a class so that when I want them to be thinking out loud and together, thoughts have begun to occur to them. And, um, a reason, so one reason I lecture at all, because I really do love, um, I think it's fun. It is, it's fun. Uh, I think people like a little bit of performance, a little bit of drama. Um, they like, and, and just, just to perform, this is worth thinking about. This is interesting to me, <laughs> is in an outsized way. Um, can... If you're saying this is worth thinking, I think, I, and I'm thinking up here. Watch me think. So, and sometimes fumbling, fumbling, getting it wrong, saying something stupid, that can also be a helpful indication that I'm, I didn't write this 10 years ago. I didn't, or if I did, I'm still living it. So, so I think I teach thinking, and what I try to do is create class formats that enable thinking. Great. Great. So when I was introducing you, I, was, I essentially said you teach American poetry. Right. Um, but, um, but it's more complex than that. Well, I think America, I'm really lucky because American poetry, my subject, which I happen to love, is a really good subject for teaching thinking. Because I can, I can do a certain amount of knowledge transfer. And, and the, another reason we have to lecture <coughs> is that anaphora, I wasn't going, or parataxis. We were not going to you know, arrive at that together in discussion. <laughs> <laughs> right? it, was a, it was a piece of information. You know, the, the Fugitive Slave Act is just not going to emerge. Um, so there's, there's information transfer that has to go on. And so I was using, uh, y using that to transfer information. But teaching poetry is an ideal 
place to teach thinking because there really aren't wrong. There can be answers that others think there isn't sufficient evidence for um, or that the evidence is further afield than we feel comfortable with. But there's a lot, there's a lot of room for people to think out loud in the room together and to stimulate each other's thought. And so I love teaching, and as I said to you when we were planning this, and maybe this does go to loafing, I love teaching poetry because if people haven't done the homework, um, you usually have them anyway by the lapels, right? And uh, you, it's like, oh, you didn't do the work? Well, too big. That, that doesn't matter. Here we are. There's the, there are the lines. Um, you know, you, you better just fake it. And, and or, or the time is now, right? There's nev it's never, it's not great if you didn't do the homework, but that's not really my problem if you have half as much understanding. And my problem is creating a space where you'll be thinking as hard as you can with the resources that you have. Great. So one other sort of um, larger question about about teaching poetry and teaching, um, either teaching poetry through teaching thinking or teaching thinking through teaching poetry. Um, do you think of yourself as um, teaching poetry or teaching Whitman or teaching Song of Myself, all of the above at once? Uh, does that question make sense? Like, are you teaching an art form, I guess, is the question. I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I think it's, you're putting a finer point on it than I, I think I have a, a sort of athlete, wrestler's approach. There's a, there, there's a set of, of ideas or realizations that if you have them about a poet, if I can help you have them yourself, you'll be able to read that poet henceforth. And, and I try to think about what is needed. <laughs> in, and with Whitman, the issues of selfhood are so obtrusive and difficult and get in so many people's way that I feel like, okay, I just have to blast through them. We just have to go fire hose on selfhood. Otherwise, we're just going to have to keep hearing about what a narcissist he is. And you may continue to think that. But with other poets, I'll, you know, they'll be so musical. You know, Poe will be, I'll say, this is sounding, I am feeling uh, hypnotized, right? I'll say, are you all feeling hypnotized by this? What is, what? What is poetry that has got us going bells, 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 bells? You know, what, what is that kind of poetry? And so I'm always looking for the, the hold. It's like a wrestler's. What's the hold that will, in 50 minutes, um, so it's kind of crude. I think you were describing a more delicate teaching practice than I have. Um, Where, oh, yes, it's an art form. Well, sometimes with, with Whitman, we don't, yes, the the beauty of a of, of song of myself overall is, um, you know, that's something I'm living with over my lifetime. And when I have, and I, when I have the opportunity to teach people Whitman over time, I'll say, live with this poem. I said, we're doing nothing here. This is just a little, live with this over your lifetime. And then you'll begin to know the poem. So one of the, um, I said to Lisa when we met uh, that I love poetry, I just can't read it. Um, and, but if I want to spend time with poetry, I will read essays about poetry. Um, essays about poetry, I can almost always get into. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, so it's just a kind of a, a mystery. And sometimes those essays take me to the poems. Sometimes they don't. Um, but often the poems are embedded in these. I can't read poems in magazines, which is where they are. <laughs> you mean, uh, uh, do you mean, for example, in the New Yorker? The New Yorker? I see a poem. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> what about a 
poetry Busman's magazine. Busman's Holiday. What about? A poetry magazine. Not my favorite. And I mean, this is, uh, this is really, that confession was nothing compared to this. Uh, I, I, I think of poetry as an event. Poetry is an event in my life. It's a reading event. Oh, I am going to take this poem out for coffee. I'm going to have some Turkish delight. It is Turkish delight. What an hour I'm going to have with this poem. I'm taking this poem into my classroom. All of these people are going to read it together. Magazine, that's just reading. That's beautiful. Do you actually, um, uh, probably not with Song of Myself, but with other perhaps shorter poems, do you read them all aloud together? Stu do I read them with students? In, the cl in class. S sometimes, but it's really, you know, class hours are not very long, and um, I think if I had five days, not that I really want them, all you um, teachers who actually are in class five days a week, God bless you, you know, were I to have five days, but I don't have that. I have two 50 minutes or two hour and 20 minutes, and so I, I will do things like, um, have there's that wonderful series the voice of the poet so i will have it on as students walk in and i always do that with frost like something there is that doesn't love a wall that you know throws a frozen ground swell under have you heard frost read that or steve you know you know that reading or langston hughes or and so i try to bring in i try to bring in the poet's voice and have students read, but it's, you know, we all operate within the constraints of the teaching, of the teaching yeah. hour, and it's yeah. really, what, like, what do I have to do? It's an emergency situation. It's like a, being an EMT. What do I have to do in this short amount of time to keep this poem alive, you know? <laughs> um, it's interesting because I, uh, I was thinking recently about a uh, talk I heard Alan Sean, the composer, mm -hmm. uh, give about his teaching. Sean, uh, I don't know if he still teaches at Bennington, but for many years he taught at Bennington a course on Mahler's symphonies. Mm -hmm. And he taught the course for many years, assigning people to go listen to the symphonies. And um, then and different students had to research different symphonies. They'd bring that in. They would talk about the symphonies in class. And then one year, uh, I'm, if he gave the reason, what was the catalyst for the switch? I don't remember. I wish I did. But um, one year, he decided to flip it. And Mahler um, came in with the students. Mahler <laughs> came in with the students. No, they sat in class together. They took all of that class time and listened together to the symphonies. And then he'd have them talk to each other outside because there wasn't there wasn't. The, the problem of time right. had intimidated him for so long. Um, and he said it was a, a remarkable difference. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, he never went back. Oh, really? Yeah, and he never went back, I think, because he found that with each group of students, he was hearing the symphonies differently. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was very powerful. But also that they reported that they actually listened. I, it's, I mean, I worry about this in us making reading assignments. Um, how do, I mean, I know, I mean, of course, students here read every one of their assignments and, and read them with, with passion and commitment. Um, but you're reading alone. Um, and I think for mm -hmm. musical work, and I include poetry, mm -hmm. in, um, it seems, uh, you know, how do you hear it? How do you get to hear it? Well, poems are, you know, we get to experience poems in different settings. On the one hand, Whitman, and I've repeated this enough times, Whitman was, is telling you, you open a book and you are, this is an intimate act. This is a, this is where we meet here when, and this is one on one. And, in, and so I think that reading poetry, and, and when I say it's an event, it's, it's sort of a date, you know, I, yeah. when I read a poem, it's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to do mind meld with this poem. And so I think there is a place for individual yeah. with poetry. On the other hand, I, 
even though I think it's sort of a shame that the classroom has become the place where people read poetry, I'm really happy that it's the place where I get to read poetry with people because it, it's collective. And there's something immensely rewarding, more rewarding, about reading with a group of people. You, you just mentioned, and I'm not sure this is related to what you were asking, but I thought of it. You mentioned things that worry you, you know, or the, and over years of teaching, I, about midway, I don't know, I, it wasn't midway, but 10 years or so into my career, I, I had already been teaching the pure contralto sings in the organ loft for 10 years. I've now taught those lines for 30 years. And I thought, oh, I shouldn't do this. This is wrong. You know, it is wrong to continue teaching the, the same lines. And there was a period where it is wrong to only teach Moby Dick and Redburn. I should really teach Pierre and, you know, that, and what I realized after a period when I kept creating more and more eccentric <laughs> syllabi was that my students were missing materials that were sometimes classic and sometimes I really knew well and that it was okay. So 30, I have literally been teaching those lines, this section 15, for 30 years always, every semester, every time, and now I don't feel guilty about it <laughs> anymore. But I do, instead of saying, I'm not going to teach section 15, I'm going to teach something else, um, I, I do make myself, uh, and this time I looked at, I've been looking, by the way, at the married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner that comes next. Mostly what I see are the the uh, short I sounds, connecting it to the carpenter, which doesn't feel very potent. <laughs> There's not much electricity. And, and mostly what I'm struck by is the pathos that's introduced by unmarried, the married and unmarried children. Just one word there. Boom, it's a pathos punch. Um, <laughs> Not sure what to do with that. So, so I just so I've never taught it really because I'm just uh, what's that doing there? I don't know, but I'm kind of thinking about it. But today I looked at the pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in a whaleboat. Lance and harpoon are ready. And I haven't really ever thought much about those lines. I looked up kingpin, and I believe that Whitman did make a mistake, uh, and it's King Post because kingpin down onto page seven of Google still means mobster. <laughs> um, King post is a uh, wooden beam in a, in a ship. And I think there, and there's an interesting little power dynamic that I'm starting to see where the pilot is seizing the kingpin and heaving down with a strong arm and the mate, and who is clearly in an inferior social position on the ship, stands braced in the whaleboat. Lance and Harpoon are ready. And there, I mean, there's, again, a dignity of some kind that is accruing to um, the mate. He's standing, he's just got his leg. And most of us can't read these lines because we don't know how whaleboats are put together. And I only know because I look it up every single time uh, and remind myself. Anyway, the point here is that I'm always trying to, to read something new, and sometimes I'm bringing that in and trying to do new material and trying to have new, new discoveries. Of course, frequently the, very, the oldest material will, I've taught it a million times, and people will say something I've never heard. Do you know why Section 15 for you? It's go-to. You know, it's become my, I don't really know why. I mean, in the beginning, do you know why you made that? In the beginning, meaning 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not reaching back too far. Um, I liked it so much. Um, 
I was a tr I think really 30 years ago <coughs> is that I was a kid who fell in love with 19th century paraphernalia, you know, and like many people who become scholars of American literature, you read Little Women, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and, you know, and not only Laura Ingalls Wilder, that, you know, you just love, oh, is Pa going to sp smoke some meat now? <laughs> Do you all remember? Right? Oh, really? They're building a smokehouse? Huh, I wonder how you do make pie out of crows. You know, that, that world of 19th century DIY, <laughs> I loved. And I still do. I, and so it was personal. It was, ah, why don't I just get inside that world of, and this is why I like teaching Moby Dick. It's somebody, I think it was Werner, Bert, Werner Berthoff who used to teach in the English department said, Moby Dick is for people who like hardware stores. <laughs> and some of you like hardware stores and some of you don't like hardware stores. And I don't love hardware stores, but I do love the stuff. And this has all that. Just has the prostitute draggles her shawl. Look at these. I mean, these lines I do all the time. The prostitute draggles her shawl, her bonnet bobs on her. Those O's are so, that bobbing of the bonnet is so, what is it, clumsy. Those short O's are so pathetic. And the bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck. And even though Whitman doesn't use rhyme and doesn't use much figurative language, he's doing so much with sound. You see, doing so much. The, the prostitute draggles her shawl, blah, blah, blah. The crowd laugh at her blackguard oaths. The men jeer and wink to each other. And then we have the president. <laughs> he's right next to her. The president holding a cabinet council is su surrounded by the great secretaries. And since the prostitute was just in a scrum of guys all kind of around him, there's a some sort of analogy or irony there. That, and the president and the prostitute both begin with the PR. And so he's inviting us to think about the, the, um, the followers, the hangers-on of both presidents and prostitutes. But there are many lines here. I was just thinking about the piazza walk, the three matrons, stately and friendly with twined arms, and then the crew of the fish smack pack, repeated layers of halibut into the whole those, those matrons all look like halibut to me now. And I think they are, I think that there's a, a, a huge, anyway, so one keeps, you just keep reading and some of the lines become part of a conversation and some of them don't. Lisa, I'm going to open it up in a second, but um, I can't help but be struck by um, how much your, um, your love and delight in this text um, seems to be uh, a really um, key element in your teaching. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, you're modeling what it means to fall in love with a poem. Yeah. No, I have, I have the good luck to teach material I love, always. Oh, isn't and, that um, <laughs> crucial for all of us, whether it's but I'm, I wonder if it's always possible. Or, and, and sometimes I have to make myself fall in love. Um, and, and, and sometimes I have to say, I'm not old enough for that, or I'm too old for that now. I mean, I think that there's, there are materials that work at different moments in the life cycle. I never understood. Hawthorne until I got old enough to have wrecked a lot of things in life, <laughs> right? You know, you don't, you can't read, don't, no one, please do not teach the Scarlet Letter to children. <laughs> they don't understand the Scarlet Letter. It begins with people who have wrecked everything, right? We've all wrecked, you know, you have to have experienced terrible resounding failure to really understand the Scarlet Letter, I think. Um, anyway, you were going to, you were actually going to ask a question. No, I was just really making the observation. I do love, the, I do um, love everything. I and, do. and I was just thinking about, um, well, maybe really thinking about how, um, 
sad it is when we go to study with someone who does not seem to be in touch with their love for their subject matter. Um, so, um, always trying to end things on a sad note, <laughs> let me <laughs> <laughs> uh, open it up. And really, I want what I want to say is, in opening it up, is um, questions, of course, but also just thoughts, associations, surprises, etc. So we'll start with Kate. Thank you so much. I'm thinking about that Hey, I'm just going to ask you to be a little bit louder. I'm thinking about the alliteration in the yeah, second line. Of, of Tipsy and Pimpled, or of the, the whistling, the wild. Oh, yeah. Um, and that, that may not actually allow us to hear that whistle. Absolutely. And I'm thinking about the way you described uh, your lecture as an aria, and you invoked Whitman's uh, interest in opera as well. And I'm thinking about the way that you seem to perform his expansive self um, for us. And I wonder if your style changes depending on the poet whom you're teaching. Some of you know. Um, I'm, I think I'm, I err on the side of cheesy drama. <laughs> uh, and I try to modulate. Um, I think one of the ways I do that is I teach a whole history of American poetry, and I'm always doing that, and they really are, the poets really do differ. And so even though I believe that a pretty italicized lecture style is usually a good idea, um, I do try to modulate. But Whitman comes naturally to me, maybe too naturally to me, because he's a performer, because he believes in performance. Um, no, but that's a, I, I, I think that it's a, um, also we, we have habits, you know, and I don't like all of my habits at all, and my mannerisms and my, you know, I don't, but I'm, they're mine. And I work around them. Well, I don't even work around them. I, but I think that this, those of us who have been teaching for a long time know the good part is that you really, even if you're not in the mood and even if you're having a bad day, you go in there and you can teach the material. But, you know, sometimes you wish you had a little more, you weren't so settled within your teaching persona. <clears throat> you to yeah. use the microphone so that <coughs> the people watching later can hear it and also so that I can. Sure. Um, you were talking about teaching thinking and you teach American poetry which makes me think you're dealing with this specifically Anglo-Saxon problem that uh, <laughs> Steve is talking about which is anxiety or worry in, face, in coming in contact with poetry. I haven't heard of it anywhere else. I have a I have a suspicion that it comes and I think Steve again by humbling himself and talking about this is pointing at where that might come from. And you say, you know, I read an essay about poetry and I'm comfortable with that, which basically that's poetry buttered over with interpretation. <laughs> um, flattened by interpretation. And this idea that poetry is something that you're supposed to labor over and bring out interpretations and thoughts. That is something through which you teach thinking. And you yourself, I can see that you're you know, in sort of a bind with this, because if, if you see it next to thoughts, which is next, say, next to, in a magazine, it disgusts you. And you have to put it <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it doesn't disgust me. It feels like a kind, it feels, it doesn't feel fun. It doesn't feel eventful enough. Okay, now that fun, that eventfulness, that cheesy drama that you're talking about, yeah. is that some kind of um, nervous reaction to that, <laughs> to that worry? Because again, that fun, that this something needs, that poetry needs to be fun and dramatic and cheesy, is a specifically Anglo-Saxon event. I don't think Russians or Iranians or the Chinese right. uh, you know, have to do that. Right, where poetry has anymore. a completely different function in the culture. Yes. How do you deal with this? How do I deal with this? Uh, you're well, within you this culture, you're teaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, yes, I came of age within um, a culture that is embarrassed by poetry, that doesn't understand poetry, that only knows how to make it a classroom activity that's good for you. And um, I've adapted very nicely <laughs> and enjoy providing instruction. I, I how would I function in a culture where poetry was how you say how you said subversive things? Po poetry was how you acted out rebellion. Poetry was how um, uh, you um, made love, which you know it's not any of those things in our culture. I don't really. Know. I mean, I think I am a teacher, and. I'm a teacher of a subject that people think of as academic and not academic, and I'm I'm there's there's the me who does sneak off with a poem and just <coughs> loves it, right? Just grooving on the poem. Um, but here and in my life, I, I, I love it as I love it as a subject for the classroom. And I, I actually love, I don't, I'm sure I haven't answered your question at all. Um, I love it as an object of thought, which may be a parlous situation, but it's true. I do. I love, I love poetry as an object of thought. I love it as an object, I love it as a, uh, the way in which it helps um, it helps us develop our faculties and, and the way in which we can activate. We can say, okay, we're, we're doing some faculty development here, and this is, it could be a poem, could be a math problem, could be a slide. I'm, I'm living fairly comfortably with that, but I'm absolutely, but I absolutely recognize that this is a pretty culturally defined place and I'm fulfilling a culturally scripted role. So I was making, I was insinuating that that culture may have been created in the classroom. That that culture may have been created in poetry classrooms, English classrooms, first starting from elementary school going on into college. Well it was, it was created in the 20s when people stopped reading poetry around the fire, when English professors needed a real subject. They weren't. They didn't want to be amateurs anymore. We wanted to have English departments where we had material to teach, and so we said, "Okay, a poem takes an hour to interpret," and that. I mean, that's really the history of the institutionalization of English. Um, we we decided that works needed interpretation, and that this was an academic activity. So you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I think it's a pretty worthy academic activity, and I'm sure that, um, that reading poems with other people, I'm sure because of all those people I've read poems with who report, who write in, who email, who text, and say, oh, I was looking, I was walking through midterm, I was walking through Midtown and I looked up at the Chrysler Building and Frank O'Hara just popped into my head, thank you Professor New. New York Midtown means something different to me. So, so I'm comfortable with the, with the role, even though mindful of its limitations. Yes. It, it's very interesting that your love of poetry, or at least Whitman's poetry, is apparent. And um, I write poetry, so my question is, do you write poetry? And does this love of reading poetry translate into writing? And if it doesn't, why not? <laughs> I don't know. I love writing prose. Um, and I wrote poetry when I was a, um, I wrote poetry, I published a bunch of poetry when I was young. And it's funny, and I think this goes to your question, I didn't want to be a poet. There, it, it was a, it, it, it's a social formation. It's a place in culture. It's a place in the academic establishment. So I didn't want to be, I didn't want my activity to be teaching poetry workshops. I didn't want, and I know this feels a little bit beside the point, so I, I didn't, I didn't like any of that. Um, 
I also found that I was spending huge amounts of time taking lots of words and trying to make them fewer. If there had been a role in the world, and there is for certain people like Derek Walcott, he can write epics. If there had been a role for big form poetry, I might have gone for it. But I like writing big. I like writing a lot. I like lots of paragraphs, uh, and I don't. And I was just killing myself to get the, get the words down. And I thought, why don't I just, you know? Now I still have to do that. I also became really interested in history and in teaching and in all sorts of activities that, that were just more compatible with being a critic. Not that I much like being a critic, per se, but that the, 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 my talents and the opportunities I had to spend my days in really fun and productive and exciting ways it just didn't point to being a poet. And so, and my husband and my children, they read old poems, they go, oh, these are pretty good. I say, well, why don't you write some more? I don't know. I don't really want to. But I'm very glad you do. Maybe time for one more question. Over, over what are the, yeah. what are the yeah. students oh, doing Terry, hold on a second. Oh, Thanks. What, what do the students do in your class? What are your assignments like for them? They, they write papers on poetry. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what do they read? What do they have to read? They read poems. Just poems? So they could commentary on poems, history Gradu of the time. Graduate students read. Graduate students. What, what I, well, I should specify even more my place within this institution. The, I've become, I wasn't always this, but I've become the person who teaches poetry to, to teach us general education poetry. So I, and I'm offering the whole smorgasbord to the engineers and the, you know, political science people and all the people think, who think, okay, I have to do something artistic and interpretive. Poems are short. That's what I will do. <laughs> and I love the cha I love that challenge. It's like, you think you don't like this. You think you're just in it for, um, I, it's my job to make you really, help you really like this. And so, yes, I have them because I think that exposition, the skills of exposition that we ask students to develop in poetry classrooms are actually skills that serve them for life. I do also teach students who go on to become poets and painters and actors and um, and it's amazing, some of them are, I've been teaching for long enough. Oof. Look at him! Um, but, um, but I, yeah, I sit inside this institutional role, which is school teacher, college teacher, uh, and the material is poetry, and, and so I'm, I'm not that, I, I love it, it, it heals my soul, but I'm not all that mystical about the activity. I, I think you can learn, you can, by reading, by offering a, uh, uh, an essay to your teacher for an assignment, a piece of exposition on a work of poetry, you can learn to sell software. You know, you can learn how to tell a story. And I'm, I'm in the business of helping people learn how to make logical arguments and over poems, over whatever it is. They can sell pizzas with the same, and they're all going to, you know, you're, and that the skills you're practicing while you're healing some of your soul are going to help you go and sell whatever you sell or do whatever you do. That's part of my job, too, just like writing letters of recommendation is part of my, it's a big, big part of my job. And these, you know, I'm a, I'm a professional, not just a lover of poesy. I love poesy, but I am a professional. Lisa, thank you so much. You're welcome. All the thank you, Jim, for having us here. So I want to say a special thanks not just to Lisa, but to Steve for being a terrific discusser. So thanks all of you.